my name is Abby LaRue, and uh, I get to read the teaching text tonight. I serve on the community group leadership team here, as well as the prayer team. So um, I would love to meet you guys. If you want to be a leader with community groups, um, come talk to me. I'm happy to like share some insight to that as well. The teaching text is Luke 23, 44 through 49. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the word of the Lord. Well, very good evening to you tonight. We are finishing our Lent series on words from the cross we have a conviction that Jesus is the most important person who's ever lived. History is split in half based on the existence and the life of Jesus. And the cross is one of the most significant events, maybe the most significant event in the life of Jesus. And on the cross, Jesus gives seven phrases, seven declarations where, in essence, he's not just preaching from his lips, he's preaching from his whole life. And uh, so we have sought to, to lean in to, to hear what Jesus is saying. The end of this verse here, it says that Jesus, uh, the group of women who follow Jesus and some of the friends watched from a distance. And we don't want to do that. We've been trying to get, close the gap. We've been trying to put ourselves into the story of Jesus to hear what it is that he says. Sometimes we get so familiar with the cross. We think we understand it. We've mastered theology that we, we lose this sense of wonder and awe. We don't see ourselves in the story. And so the reason we've done this series for Lent is to put ourselves in the story. Rembrandt in 1633 painted a picture called The Raising of the Cross for Prince Frederick Henry of Orange. It's now kept in a museum in Munich. But he painted this picture and uh, it's one of those classical paintings depicting uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But many people who've observed not just the beauty of this, uh, the painting, but the details of this painting have realized something uh, that stands out a little bit. If you look closely, next slide, you'll see that at the foot of the cross, there's a man with a blue beret at the bottom of the feet of Jesus. And if you've ever taken in even an introductory course on uh, first century apparel, you'll realize that the beret probably wasn't uh, available. But what, Rem, what Rembrandt did was to paint himself into the story. This was his portrait. He said, look, you know, the, the, the death of Jesus wasn't just a historical event thousands of years ago. It's my story. I'm in the story. Jesus is on the cross because of me. I want to lean in. I want to hear what he says because this is the story that I'm a part of. And that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to get ourselves into the story. Not just see it from a distance, not just believe it theologically, but comprehend what it is that Christ has said. Now tonight we come to these words of Jesus, the last words that Jesus speaks on earth. I'm going to think about that. Think of all the things that Jesus taught. And now as we look through the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of John, as Jesus knows the cross is drawing near, he spends more and more time with his disciples and he's just pouring out teaching to his disciples. Then it finally comes to the end of his life. He's taught them the most important things. And now the final words. What is it that Jesus wants to leave in our minds? On earth, the Son of God. What is it he wants to leave us with? And these are the words we hear. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus' final act was an act of trust. An act of surrender to his Father. This is the declaration he wants to leave. In the garden, Adam believed the lie, you can't trust God. And here is Jesus' final words, trust him. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now the reason that I think this carries particular weight for us, the kinds of modern people that we are, is that it's very, very hard for us to genuinely surrender and to entrust ourselves to other people, isn't it? And we've basically had a nuclear meltdown of trust in our society. I was reading an article in the Harvard Business Review this past week 
This is what it says. For 17 years, the Edelman Trust Barometer has surveyed tens of thousands of people across dozens of countries about their level of trust in business, media, government, and NGOs. This year was the first time the study found a decline in trust over all four of these institutions. In almost two-thirds of the 28 countries we surveyed, the general population did not trust the four institutions, quote, to do what is right. The average level of trust in all four institutions combined was below 50%. You are, if you're a millennial, the least trusting generation in American history. Only 19% of millennials trust other millennials. <laughs> Only 19% trust in our world today. In fact, The Atlantic did an article where they commented on the idea of a distrust trap, which basically is it's a, it's a reinforcing cycle. When you distrust people, you basically withdraw emotional resources, intellectual resources, financial resources. You basically only give to those you can believe in and you consciously try and exclude those you can't trust. And as a result, our society is getting more and more polarized, more and more broken, more and more suspicious, more and more selfish. Who do we trust? We can't trust the media at all. We can't trust politicians. Can't trust our neighbors. How many of you just love your neighbors, just leave the door open, come in at will? <laughs> trust religious leaders? We trust our parents? Can we trust our spouses, the amount of divorce that happens in our world today? Who can we trust? One of the things that, that shocked me when I moved to the United States on our money here, it says, in God we trust. And I want to say, excuse me, that's not true. Dear America, you don't. You trust in money. You don't trust in God. Just take, take, leave him out of it. We live in a society where people just feel like they can't trust anybody. And as a result of that, the response is that we take on the job of trusting only ourselves. We basically say, it's up to me that I can't hand my life, my heart, my emotions, my future over to other people. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust myself. And what this generates, particularly for people who have the instincts to arrive in a place like New York, is this produces an idol of control. Anybody in New York who's here is prone to this. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, folks. You're living a deliberate, cautious, careful life that's brought you to this moment. We even have a term for this in our society on a common level. It's somebody who is a control freak, the control freak. And we banter it around, don't we? You're such a control freak. But if we really slowed that down and changed the tone, you are a control freak. A freak. Because we want everything to go our own way. We're controlled by fear. Howard Thurman in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, says this. There's nothing new or recent about fear. It is doubtless as old as the life of man on the planet. Fears of many kinds, fear of objects, fear of people, fear of the future, fear of nature, fear of the unknown, fear of old age, fear of disease, fear of life itself. Then there's the fear which has to do with aspects of experience and detailed states of mind. Our homes, institutions, prisons, churches are crowded with people who are hounded by day and harrowed by night because of some fear that lurks ready to spring into action as soon as one is alone or as soon as the lights go out or as soon as one's social defenses are temporarily removed. So what I want to do just for a few minutes before we look at Jesus' surrender is just perhaps give you a few diagnostic questions to see whether or not the idol of control is functioning in your life. The first area, if you're a control freak, is this, that you're going to want to control the timing of your life. You're not going to trust God to work out the details of your life. You're going to take the timing of your agenda into your own hands. And this, this is, can be very, very challenging to us. Life used to be quite simple many years ago. There was basically a, a pretty simple cultural script based on the aging stage of your life. You matured through puberty into adulthood, at which point you got married and you got a job and then you had a family and then you retired and moved to where, somewhere warmer. I mean, that was the basic arc of your life. And it looked pretty similar to the vast majority of people, but now everything just seems out of order. And so we're not quite sure. A lot of us still have these deep internal scripts, either from for family or society. We want our lives to go a certain way, but it just seems that everything's out of order. Now, some 60-year-olds are fathering children, and some women are having babies as teenagers. 
which, which is the order that we're supposed to live in? People are going back in their 60s to college and some young people are not going to college. It's just all out of order. And so if you've got a desire in your heart for a way that it should go and it doesn't follow along, quite often for the Christian, this is the place of greatest temptation to compromise. God, that relationship, I need that to be here and it's not here. And so I'm just going to date someone your word says not to because it's better than being alone. Well, Father, I, I need something. I don't have the resources financially for it, but I'm going to violate biblical principles because I want it, because I want it now, because I live in a culture of the immediate. But taking things into our own hands doesn't seize our destiny. It sabotages it. Look at what happened to Saul in 1 Samuel 13. You know the story of Saul. He's Israel's first king. He's tall. He's good looking. He's a leader. And he has this moment where they're facing their arch nemesis, the Philistines, and they sort of poke, poke the hornet's nest. The, the Philistines come out, chariots, horses, and an ocean, it says, as vast as the sand on the sea. And so his men are sort of pinned down and as they're rallying around, calls for Samuel the prophet to come and bless them. They don't want to go into battle on their own. They need God's protection and God's favor. But Samuel's late. Says he's going to be there in seven days and he's not quite there. And then Saul's men begin to lose heart. They begin to scatter. And so he says, you know what? I can't, I can't lose my men. What am I going to do then? Looking only at the natural, taking himself out of God's covenant care and into his own hands. He says, you know what? Bring the sacrifices here. I'll offer them myself. And so he oversteps his bounds, plays the role of a priest and a prophet, offers his sacrifices. And as soon as he's done, it's almost Shakespearean. As soon as he's done, Samuel rolls up and says, what is this that you have done? And he says, well, when I saw that you were delayed and the men began to scatter, I took things basically into my own hands. I offered the sacrifices. And Samuel says, you have done a foolish thing. And he says, the kingdom will be taken away from you and it's going to be handed to someone with a heart after God. And so as a result of trying to be his own king, he lost the kingdom and it was given to somebody else. And so often this happens in our lives. Controlling timing. The need to get things done when we want is one of the signs of the idol of control. The second thing is controlling outcomes, which means we will do whatever it takes to get things to turn out the way that we want. Now, the the challenge of a place like this is there's so many obstacles to actually getting your life to turn out how you want. So many forces at work. So many other people competing for these same limited resources. What happens when you try and control your outcomes is that very, very often you overstep bounds. And for for believers, there's a lot of temptation to sort of compromise to achieve the desired results. And this almost always results in scandals. I was thinking about the college admissions scandal that's just basically taken over the news quite recently. It's it's people whose children weren't hardworking enough or intelligent enough or athletically gifted enough, having parents with money who basically bought them positions in a universities that they don't deserve to be in, or athletic scholarships they probably don't qualify for. You think about that level of drive. What is it in the parent's heart that said, you will go to Yale? And they said, well, I don't have the grades. That doesn't matter. You're going to Yale. <laughs> and they basically tried to, to overstep their bounds because they want to manufacture their life so that they could drop in moments the right moments. Oh, where did Tommy go to school? Well, you know, we ended up at Georgetown. He turned down Yale. You, can, you set this sense of needing to manufacture a life, control a life. Controlling outcomes is a form of idolatry, an addiction to making sure we get what we want. Another thing people get addicted to is to controlling other people. Now, this is terrifying because it's been my general experience that the typical person doesn't love being manipulated and controlled. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. It's happening to all of you all of the time if you have a phone. But we don't consciously love the practice of being manipulated and controlled. And so as a result, we can often feel like, you know, because it is terrifying, honestly, to to give your heart to someone and they just run off. They go. And so we can do everything within our power to manipulate, to control. Sometimes it's very subtle. If we know someone has a low self-esteem, we just place well-timed comments about their looks so they never gain confidence to leave you. Sometimes if you're a manager and you have power and you see someone coming up underneath you and you're worried they're going to blow past you and take your position, sometimes you just change the reports a little bit, giving their their performance reviews or just when you talk with HR, you just put a few comments in there. It'll just slow them up so you can get your act together. This just happens in so many ways 
our need to control others. Now, this is a form of idolatry. But I think the worst idolatry is not just trying to control timing or outcomes or other people, it's trying to control God. The worst idolatry is religious idolatry where we believe that by our performance we can make the God of the universe do what we want. And if this happens, if you become, and a lot of people, there's a lot of people in the Christian tradition who aren't genuinely in an authentic relationship with God. They're using God to get what they want and they're just using the Christian faith as a way of doing it. And if this happens, all of the trust will be in our own performance. It will be a deep rigidity in our faith deep dogmatism because you can't have mystery sabotaging your outcomes it'll be all technique the way that you master it and can do it to get the results that you want and in some sense you know if, if god doesn't do what you want it produces terrible heartache and anger towards him this is basically what happened on palm sunday on palm sunday we're celebrating christ riding in on a donkey, not an amazing start compared to like a stallion or whatever, but here he is. And as Christ rides into Jerusalem, all the people are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At last, someone with a courage, someone with supernatural power. Did you hear the rumors about him? He basically could multiply food. He fed thousands of people. Imagine what will happen when he gets in power. He just does it every week. They wanted to come and make him king because he provided for their tangible needs. Or supernatural miracles. Anybody who's sick, he can just say a word and they'll be healed. If he can do that to disease, what, imagine what he can do to the Romans. And how excited they were as he rides into Jerusalem. Yet just several days later, the same people yelling, Hosanna, are yelling, crucify him. Why? Because he didn't do what they thought. The Romans got him and here they are, parading him through the streets like a failure and then they crucify him. They put him on a cross and he dies. What sort of, what use is there for a God like that? Give us another Messiah. Didn't work. You know, th this is so deeply embedded in American evangelical theology that it becomes very, very tempting towards all of us. We're told, look, if you just wait till you have, uh, wait till you get married before you have sex, God will bless you with a perfect incredibly amazing, lifelong, wonderful sex life. Have a perfect marriage. If you just tithe, you'll never have financial problems again. God will just bless your money forever. Or if you pray a certain amount, you can fend off disaster so nothing will ever come near you. But it doesn't quite work like that. God's not a sex counselor or a financial counselor or a bodyguard that walks around just protecting us. That's not the life of faith. That's a life of control. Fails to take into account the world that we live in. And so if we're not careful, rather than living our lives to do God's will, we will want God to do our will. Scott Jutani says this, My secret is that I want to be relevant and popular. I want my desires fulfilled and pain minimized. I want a manageable relationship with an institution rather than messy relationships with real people. I want to be transformed into the image of Christ by showing up at entertaining events rather than through the hard work of discipline. I want to wear my faith on my sleeve and not look at the darkness in my heart. And above all, I want a controllable God. I want a divine commodity to do my will on earth as it is in heaven. And yet this is the great challenge for us. The idol of control. And so here you have Jesus' final words. And he's on the cross. And what does he say? Surrender. Father, into your hands. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You see, we can even manipulate obedience to try and get God to do what we want. If I obey you, will you? And that can be partial obedience. But the posture of the Christian life is just surrender in spite of circumstances. Fleming Rutledge says, The Christian life is lived between my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And into my hands I commit your spirit. It's just that posture of like when it's not going how I want it to go. And even though it costs me, Lord, here I am. This is the life of surrender. Obedience is a momentary decision. It evaluates moment by moment, will I obey or not? But surrender is the posture of the kingdom. It just says, I start with yes, regardless of the circumstances. Now, how can Jesus do this? Even though it costs him, I'm not trying to make light of this, it costs Jesus. Remember, he sweat drops of blood, ultimately resigning his will to the Father's will. This, is, this has to be fought for. This won't happen on accident. But ultimately, what brings him over? One word, Father. Father. 
Father is Jesus' opening manifesto on earth. I've got to be about my father's business. This was his cry as a teenager. In the Sermon on the Mount, he speaks of the father 17 times. It's central to his understanding of kingdom ethics. As he's moving through the Paschal Discourse found in John 14 through 16, Jesus uses the word father more than 45 times. In the next chapter, John 17, when he's giving his great high priestly prayer, he uses the term father six more times. And now the last words is on his lips as he dies, father, into your hands I commit my spirit. At the start of his life, the father announces, this is my beloved son. And at the end of Jesus' life, his final cry is, this is my trustworthy father. This is his relationship on earth. I find this extraordinary because... There's a prayer that small Jewish children would pray every night before they would go to sleep in case something happened when they slept. And it was this prayer from Psalm 35, into your hands I commit my spirit. I want you to see this image, a small child praying with their father by their bed. In your hands I commit my spirit. And here is Christ on the cross referencing this verse to describe his childlike trust that in spite of it all, as he leaps into the void, the father will catch him. Now, when Jesus makes this declaration, I want you to see this because the author notes this, that Jesus calls out with a loud voice. He doesn't whimper this from the cross. He doesn't say it through gritted teeth. Jesus declares this. One scholar says this, that for Jesus to have cried with a loud voice, as Luke says, would mean that he had to muster nearly all of his remaining strength just to accomplish a loud cry because crucifixion kills its victims by suffocation. The arms and legs become too weak to support the breathing. And so Jesus wants to preach this one final word. He summons all of his strength and then he cries out to anybody who will listen, the father will catch me into his hands. I give my spirit. And this has to be raised over our lives. This has to be when we come to the point where we wrestle all the way through to surrender, that we declare over our lives, Father, into your hand I commit my relationships. Father, into your hand I commit my finances. Father, into your hand I commit timing. Father, into your hand I commit outcomes. We have to preach that. We have to raise our voices and declare that over our lives, particularly in a place like New York. The rebellious person doesn't feel like they need to trust anybody. They're self-sufficient. They don't put anything into anybody else's hands. The religious person's trusting in their own performance. They're trusting in themselves to save themselves. Jesus' whole trust was in his Father. Father, in a loud voice, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Many authors have written about this moment in Jesus' life. They've talked about this moment of surrender. Brennan Manning, one of them, a Catholic author and theologian. And his entire life, he wrestled with same-sex attraction. And he just, he just felt this desire to, to live out the historic Christian ethic regarding sexuality, but he just felt torn. And so his whole life was just this posture of surrender. And so one of the things that towards the end of his life, he sort of embodied as a metaphor, he, he found out, uh, and I, I actually don't know how he got into this, but towards the end of his life, he basically got into a high-flying troop, like, in a, like on the trapeze, like in a circus. And uh, he, he found out that when you, were, when you were on the trapeze and you were letting go to surrender, that the only way that the, the catcher could properly catch you is if you stood deadly still. And that moment of swinging out and letting go and just extending yourself and waiting to be caught, he said, felt like his entire life's existential struggle to just sit still and let go and trust, hanging in space, that he'd be caught. And so this was like, hey, how was the weekend, Brendan? Yeah, it's pretty good, man. What'd you get up to? Well, I was hanging in space in a flying troop that I'm a, a part of. Really? You're in your 60s? Yeah, it still works. <laughs> I mean, what an amazing event. But he resonated so much with the experience of surrender. It became part of a passion in his life. Well, John Ortberg, commenting on this, says this, the word trapeze, a little bar between the ropes that a trapeze artist has to let go of, comes from the ancient Greek trapeze, meaning table. About the only time it's used in the New Testament is when the writer claims that Jesus gathers his friends around the table of trapeze, or what we now call the communion table, and teaches them that he will have to let go of his life for them. And the only way to hang on to one's life is to let it go. Then he climbs on the cross and lets go. 
He hangs above the earth for three hours with his hands stretched out, not moving a muscle. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, he breathes. When he did that, he was saving us and he was teaching us about trust. Here's the leap. God comes to you and says, let go. Will you let go? Now, that's a, that's, that preaches well, doesn't it? That's lovely. So I used this one Sunday night when our church used to meet in a theater in Times Square. And I had some friends come up to me afterwards and they said, uh, John, that's a beautiful analogy. But just so you know, it's incomplete. And look, people say all sorts of weird stuff to me after I preach. And uh, I had one gentleman come up to me and say, hey, I just want you to know I have a pet kangaroo. I was like, great, man, good for you. People say all sorts of crazy stuff. So when they, when they, that actually happened. So when that came, when these people came forward and they said, hey, you're actually missing like a central part of that metaphor and uh, we'd like to fill the gaps in for you. We're actually in trapeze school right now. We'd like to grant you some lessons to come to trapeze school. And just like I say to a lot of people, like, yeah, sure, no worries, great. And uh, so they followed up and made an appointment. And uh, the day actually came where I find myself in a car driving to Brooklyn with my wife to go to trapeze school. Now, I've, I've given this very little thought, and I'm somewhere out in Brooklyn, and I'm just walking through nowhere, and all of a sudden, I see a gigantic tent. And I just realized, oh gosh, they do the thing in the air. In the air, I'm terrified of heights. I, in my mind, I'm thinking perhaps a trampoline in a foam pit or some mattresses on the floor. And so I immediately begin looking for ways to get out of this. I'm like, look, man, look, this body says rugby, not trapeze. Because so I'm like, is there a weight limit? Like, there's got to be a weight limit. Who's going to catch me? And uh, so I'm looking it up. I'm like, aha, there is a weight limit and I'm over it. So I show up and I'm like, hey, excuse me, you know, my wife's here. She's under the weight limit for women. But uh, I'm actually, I'm, I, I don't know how good your insurance is. I don't want to jeopardize the tent. I don't want to jeopardize everything. They're like, you'll be fine. I'm like, are you sure I'll be fine? And they're like, you'll be fine, man. People like you show up all the time. I'm like, oh, okay. So we, we get there and they, you go through these trainings, which are very awkward. And uh, so they, I basically find myself compelled only by the fear of man, climbing up. I, like, you've got to see, I'm climbing up like a, a circus tent, standing on a tiny platform, and this sadistic person who takes joy in terrorizing people like me hands me this trapeze. And I'm like, what am I? And they're just like, you got to go. And, I, and my wife's behind me, and there's pe- the whole room's looking at me now. And uh, so I'm like, stuff it, and I just jump. Now, I'm unable to comprehend any training in sheer terror that I've experienced at this point. So I try and do a chin-up. I'm like, I'm flying through the air. So I clinch in a chin-up. And it's, like, it's swinging like this. And I'm in a chin-up, and I'm literally... And uh, everyone's shouting instructions. I hear nothing. And I'm praying in tongues over my biceps. I'm speaking life. And eventually, like, my arms just give out and I just fall. I fall into this net and there's, like, terrified applause as I sort of get off. And one of the person comes up to me and says, your arms are going to be sore for two weeks. Seriously. For two weeks, I was like, I, can't, I had dinosaur arms. I, like, I can't eat, Christy. I can't get my hands to my mouth. I was so, so it was extraordinary. <laughs> so my friends at this point come over and choose to inform me of the missing part of the metaphor. And they're like, hey, here's what you got wrong. When you learn to do this, you have no concept of timing. You, doubt, you, you don't want to let go and you don't know when to let go. And so there's actually someone who runs the whole trapeze school as you're learning to let go. And he basically s- sees everything that's happening. So the person who's going to catch you, like he sends them out. And then when you're going, he tells you when to jump. And then you jump off. And when you're hanging out, and when he sees the timing just perfectly right, he yells out, hep! When he yells out, hep, you let go. And then the person catches you, and then you swing off. And they're like, you've, you've told people to surrender, but they don't know how to. They don't know which voice to listen to. And so you've got to learn to surrender by listening to the right voice. I'm like, oh, okay. So the next time I go up again, get like basically with my gimp arms, I'm like, I can't get up. 
I get to the top. This time I swing out and I'm trying to just like hang by my arms. It's hard. Don't judge me. It's harder than it sounds. I dare you to go out to Brooklyn and do this. So I'm swinging out, to, and this time the guy's yelling, hep, and I'm yelling, no, no. He starts yelling, hep, and I start yelling back at him, no, no, no. I just can't do it. I can't do it. And so I very, very awkwardly sort of fall sort of on my side. Again, sort of horrified applause, and I roll over. And I'm like, thanks, guys. It's been amazing. You spent money on this. I'm going to get tacos. I get the metaphor. I get the metaphor. And they're like, just do it one more time. Just do it one more time. By the way, my wife's up there, like, basically doing demi pliés in the air. I mean, it's all happening. So, so I get back up one more time, and I just say to myself, I've got to listen to the voice. And so I just say, I'm going to do it with my eyes closed. And all I'm going to do is listen. So I get up, and this, I just block out this satanic opposition from this person. <laughs> hands me and I just swing out with my eyes closed and I'm just listening and as soon as I hear it, hep, I just let go. I let go. Now, I want to say it was beautiful. <laughs> Here's my point. <laughs> Preaching a metaphor on surrender is easy. Hanging in the air is terrifying. And, and I'm telling you, many of you, you understand biblical theology. But when God's saying to you, give the relationship up, and you have to hang out over the edge of loneliness, datelessness, this can be terrifying. God, will anybody ever catch me? Am I just going to be up here in an eternity? I'm going to fall on my face. When God's saying, I want you to trust me financially. You've been living in the way of the world. I'm calling you to the way of Jesus. And you have to like write the check or give something. And you're just like hanging up there. Look, I don't know. I can't afford this. Can I trust you? It can be terrifying. But here's the whole thing. All of the growth happens in the experience, not just the recognition of the theological point. And a lot of people can believe what Jesus is telling us to, to trust our Father. But we can live lives functionally controlled by this idol the idol of control. And so tonight, I think it would just be absolutely horrific if we've gone all the way through Jesus preaching to us from the cross, showing us that it's by grace, forgiving his enemies, building a new family. All of these words that Jesus has spoken, you'll never be forsaken because I'm forsaken for you. And then to come to this moment where he's like, now I'm asking you to take up your cross. Now I'm asking you to join me in surrendering to the Father and you just say, no, I get the metaphor. I'm going for tacos. What a tragedy that would be to not actually surrender what it is that God's calling you to surrender. You know, if, if you come up to the border of your destiny, but you choose not to obey, you know what happens? There's one place that you go next. You know where that is? You go to the wilderness. You go to the wilderness. When the Holy Spirit brings you to a moment, one of two things will happen. And you choose to say, I won't surrender. You will lose your intimacy with God. The voice will get quieter. You start saying he doesn't speak anymore. And he's like, I spoke a lot. You didn't hear what I wanted to say. And the second thing that happens is that you will just go on a cycle where God will take you through some very hard things to soften up your heart. And you'll be brought back to the exact same decision later. You will literally just be doing laps in nowheresville. And you'll come back to the same moment. And so he's just like, just come in. Yes, behold, there's giants. I get it. Yes, there's these things that are terrifying. But look at what we have. Abraham. What did Abraham have? Almost nothing. God appears to him. He's like, hey, mate, I'm the true God. I want you to leave everything you know and just follow me. Where are we going? Wherever I say. Okay. And off he goes. He has no track record. He has no Old Testament. He has no father into your hands I commit my spirit. He has no 2,000 years of watching God work in the lives of saints. He doesn't understand the resurrection, but he just leaves off. But we have this giant track record of the faithfulness of God and the history of the church where we can say, even though it feels crazy in the moment, I know he will work this out for my good. That's why we're going to celebrate the resurrection next week. What happens to Jesus when he entrusts himself into his father's care? The father raises him from the dead as the resurrected Lord of history. 
And it's not until we're willing to die that he gives us resurrection life. And so we have to come to this moment of surrender. So I ask you this question, and it's a simple question, but it's this. Father, into your hands I commit what? What's your call to surrender tonight? What is it, as I've been preaching, the Holy Spirit's just been like speaking in your head, just preaching to you, and you're like, well, it can't be that, it can't be that. It's that. (laughs) It's that. What is it that you sense him challenging you in? Where is it that perhaps the idol of control has gotten in and you've stopped trusting the sovereignty of God and you're relying on the sovereignty of self? Where do you need to just say, okay, God, I'm just going to believe because of what you did for your son, because of what you've done through the saints throughout history. I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Has God put something like that in your heart tonight? I want to urge you to hand it over to him, just to, to, not just to obey, but just to surrender, to give him your life. It's, it's, it's amazing what God will do with the surrendered life. It's amazing what he'll do in your heart. It's amazing what he'll do through you. It's amazing what he'll do around you. And so I want to just call us tonight as we close out this Lent series, as we move towards Holy Week, as we consider the cross, as we look at the resurrection, that you tonight, you take up your cross. You say, Jesus, I'm with you. I surrender. I lay down the idol of control. I lay down this thing. I've actually had just like quite an extraordinary response today. So many things people have said, man, that was for me. You know, I've actually, I just, I haven't trusted the Father's heart for my life. I just, I can't trust that he's good. I just can't trust that he's going to work it out. And, and tonight I just see I can trust him. And I just, I just surrender to him. Maybe you're here tonight and you've, you're from a distance. Like you, you understand it all, but tonight... Like a Rembrandt, you're like, oh my gosh, that's actually the true story for me. I realize Jesus is on the cross because I've crucified him. I've yelled out, crucify him. He's there because of my sin, but now I see he's actually dying for me that I may have his life. Maybe the thing you need to surrender tonight is just your whole life. Jesus, I believe you're dying for my sin and I trust you. So wherever you are, can we just bow our heads and just close just by responding to what the Holy Spirit has asked us to respond to tonight? St. Ignatius of Leola says this, sin is an unwillingness to trust that what God wants is our deepest happiness. To genuinely believe that God knows better than you. And so Father, we just repent tonight of just the idol of control, Lord, of having to control the timing of our life, having to control the outcomes of our life, having to control the people in our lives. Lord, using you as a genie to do our will in our kingdom. Father, we just thank you that what you've got is so much better. And so, Father, tonight we just we just open our hearts to you in a posture of surrender. Lord, we just say, here we are, Lord. We, do, we surrender our sexuality to you. We surrender our money to you. We surrender our power to you. We surrender the vision and dreams of our hearts to you, Lord God. And we just say, here we are, Father. Lord, for some people this will be easy because they've been so abused by sin that the gospel is such good news, Lord. But there's other people, this is like, this is their sweat and blood even thinking about giving this up. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, strengthen their obedience tonight. Lord, we just want to live lives that please you, Lord. We don't want to head into the wilderness. We want to enter into your promises, your purposes for us. And so I just pray, Lord, just release tonight just a spirit that says, Father, you're good, and into your hands I surrender my life. So, Lord, see us now. Holy Spirit, come. Just bring conviction where it's needed. Bring hope where it's needed. Bring strength where it's needed. And just make us a kingdom people who take up their cross and find life everlasting in the way of Jesus. So we thank you for your word tonight. We respond to your word. Thank you for writing us in to your story of redemption. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to close in worship.